Amen. Well, thank you for praying together this morning. One of our values as a church is to pray first. And uh, everything that we do, we want to be bathed and saturated in prayer. And I love Matthew 9:38 because it's Jesus' prayer request. You know, so maybe sometimes you've asked somebody, how can I pray for you? And if we ask Jesus how we could pray, he would say, pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he would send out workers into the harvest. So that's our prayer as a church. And we join with other churches all around the nation and all around the world in praying that God would raise up workers who would go and tell the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Brother Earl and Josh and Jordan and Miss Teresa. Uh, Miss Teresa Weaver is our missionary out of our church, sent by Orlando Baptist Church to Albania. Um, how, how many years now, Miss Teresa? 28 years, getting close to 30 years. So praise the Lord for that. And she's going to be leaving on Wednesday to go back to Albania. She's been in the States uh, back and forth a little bit uh, in the last couple of years as her helping take care of her parents. And, um, and so she's going back to Albania for a little while, uh, leaving on Wednesday. And so be praying for her as she goes. Uh, if you see her before you leave this morning, pray, pray for her and with her. And uh, we, we are so grateful to partner with you. And we are so grateful for you, Ms. Teresa. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Well, we're going to continue our series in the book of Hebrews today. Uh, we're going to be in Hebrews, the end of Hebrews chapter 3 and beginning of Hebrews chapter 4. This series is called Jesus is Better. And uh, we've been talking about the reality that Jesus is better than anything else. He's better than all things, not some things not better than some other spiritual ideas. He's better than anything that this world has to give us. He is better than everything. And so it starts off right in chapter one of Hebrews, telling us that in the past God spoke through the prophets, but now he speaks to us through his son. And we saw in Hebrews chapter one that Jesus is the better and final Word of God. Jesus is the better and final word of God. He's better because he completes all that God began to tell in the Old Testament through the prophets. He completes God's promises to us. And he fulfills God's promises to us. He is the final word because nothing else comes after him. When Jesus revealed God to us, then all of revelation was done. There's nothing else we need to learn about who God is because in Jesus we have seen God. He is the image of God, the exact imprint of his nature, Hebrews 1 tells us. So Jesus is the better. And final word, that was week one and week two. We saw that Jesus is better, superior to the angels. Jesus is better than the angels. And, and the writer of Hebrews is showing us this idea that Jesus is not just this spiritual being like, a, like this angelic being. He is the son of God. He is better than, than just spiritual ideas. And in our culture, we, ha we have a lot of spirituality. But spirituality is no good if it is not rooted and anchored in the person of Jesus Christ. And so the writer wants us to understand that Jesus is better than the angels. It, je, following Jesus is not just being spiritual or religious. He, he's better than the angels. We see that at the end of chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, John Adams preached and showed us that Jesus is the founder of our salvation. We are saved because Jesus instituted and founded salvation for us. He is the pioneer, the perfecter, the author. The, pie, the, the, the foundation of our faith. And we saw that in Hebrews chapter 2. And then last week, we saw that Jesus is better than Moses. And the kind of closing passage uh, of Hebrews chapter, the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 3 tells us that Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's household, as a testimony to what would be said in the future. That, that future was the coming of Jesus Christ. But Christ was faithful as a son over his household, and we are that household. If we hold on to our confidence and the hope in which 
we boast. So I just wanted to catch you up really quick on where we've been in the book of Hebrews. If you haven't been here, you can go to our uh, youth church, Orlando Baptist Church YouTube page, and all those sermons are there if you want to catch up on the full thing. But that's the recap, okay? And I, I wanted to read you those couple of verses in Hebrews chapter 3, 5, and 6 because they lead us into where we're headed this morning. The rest of Hebrews chapter 3 and a little bit of chapter 4. It's a long section of scripture that we're going to be looking through, but there is, there is one idea in this long passage of scripture that we're going to get today. So there's two things in that Hebrews 3, 5, and 6. Moses was faithful as a servant over the house, but Christ was faithful as a son, and we are that house if we hold on to our hope and confidence. So there's two things to see. One is there's this reference to Moses and God's people in at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 3. And in the rest of Hebrews chapter 3, we're going we're gonna to learn from the nation of Israel. We're going to learn from God's people maybe what a lack of faith looks like. And there's going to be application for us. So, so look for that as we head into the next section. And then the other thing uh, we're going to see that, that kind of continues in the rest of the teaching for today is this idea of holding on to our hope and confidence in our faith. We, we wrapped up with that last week, and it, it's, a, it's kind of a difficult idea because salvation is by grace through faith, by grace alone through faith alone. It's not something that we work for, and yet the author of Hebrews instructs us to, to have this persevering faith, holding on to our faith, following through on our faith, enduring to the end in our faith. And so this morning, really, we're going to talk about what that looks like. And I'm going to ask you to pray for me because it's, it's, it's deep water, okay? So let, let me uh, ask you a couple of questions really quick. Uh, do you believe that the Bible is God's word? Yes. Yeah. And uh, if, if, if God's word says it, do you want to live your life in accordance with that? Yes. Good. Okay. So when I say some stuff today and it makes you a little bit mad, just know <laughs> that it's God's word. It's not me, Okay. So uh, let me read. Uh, so our title for the message this morning is Rest Through Faith for Today. Rest Through Faith for Today. And so we're going to see three themes in this passage, this idea of rest. The author calls it a Sabbath rest. And that, and that really is salvation. We're resting in Christ, not in our own work. We're, we're resting in Christ. And, and we can have this rest. We can have it today. He's going to say over and over, today, 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 today. Don't put it off. Don't wait. Today is the day. And then lastly, that that comes through faith. And so we're going to see all of these ideas as I read the passage this morning. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to let you stay seated as I read it. Um, I'm going to read Hebrews 3, 7 through 19, and then chapter 4, 1 through 13. So it's kind of a long passage, but I want you to follow along and I want you to notice the word today. Everybody say today. today. All right, I want you to notice how many times the author says today. I want you to notice the word rest. Everybody say rest. rest. I want you to notice how many times he says that. Then I want you to notice references to faith. He's going to talk about unbelief, which is the opposite of faith. And he's going to talk about faith and believing. So notice all of these themes and ideas. We're going to start in Hebrews 3. Seven. And if you, if you underline and circle and make notes in your Bible, then you can circle those words today and rest and those ideas about faith. One other thing, right at the beginning, the author is going to quote from the Old Testament. And he's quoting from Psalm 95, Psalm 95. And so that's, that's kind of our look back in the Old Testament today. And so I uh, just want you to know that as we head in. Okay, Hebrews 3, 7 through 19 and 4, 1 through 13. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, one more quick note, okay? <laughs> when we read the Bible, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. When we read God's word, it is God's word to us. So the author is wanting us to know, hey, this is not my words. This is not men's words. This is the words of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked to anger with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my anger, 
they will not enter my rest. That was a quote from the end of Psalm 95. And then the author turns to us, watch out brothers and sisters so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage each other daily while it is still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the reality that we had at the start. As it is said, again, a quote, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who heard and rebelled? Wasn't it all who came out of Egypt under Moses? With whom was God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Chapter four. Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, let us be aware that none of you be found to have fallen short. For we also have received the good news just as they did, but the message they heard did not benefit them since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. For we who have believed enter the rest in keeping with what he said. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. That's a quote from Genesis. Again, in that passage, he says, they will never enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, that is his rest, and those who formerly received the good news, they did not enter it because of disobedience. He again specifies a certain day today. He specified this speaking through David after such a long time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken about another day. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. And it concludes with this, for the word of God is living and effective. It is sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Let's pray. God, thank you that your word is alive, that it is active, that it has the power to penetrate and point out those areas of unbelief in our life. So Lord, let us submit our lives to your word this morning. Lord, speak through your word. Speak through your word. Holy Spirit, convict and convince this morning. Do what only you can do for your glory and for your honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Okay, here we go. Rest for today through faith. So first we're going to look at this idea of faith by looking at a negative example of faith. The unbelief of Israel. So Hebrews 3, 7, it says, the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing where your ancestors tested me, tried me, saw my works for 40 years, and I was provoked to anger saying, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my way. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. And then down in verse 16, he says, who heard and rebelled those who came out of Egypt under Moses, with whom was God angry? Those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness. And to whom did he swear they will not enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So what was the sin of Israel? Ultimately, it was unbelief. It was a lack of faith. It was unbelief. And Hebrews uses phrases like this. They had hard hearts. 
They tested God. They were going astray. They didn't know God's ways. They were turning away from the living God. They were rebelling. They were sinning. They were disobeying. But ultimately, the root of all of that is unbelief. In our lives, our sin, our rebellion, our hard-heartedness comes ultimately from unbelief. And the author is saying, hey, learn from Israel. God had a promised land for them. It started with Abraham hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before he said, Abraham, I'm giving you this land as far as you can see. And Israel went into captivity in Egypt. And then God raised up Moses to lead them out, to lead them to the promised land. But they didn't get to the promised land. They didn't get to the rest, God's promise for them because of what? Unbelief. So let's look at it just really quick. I'm going to read you the kind of hot takes, all right, of Israel's unbelief. Exodus chapter 14, they've left Egypt. They're at the Red Sea, they're about to cross over. The Egyptian army's coming from behind and at Exodus 14, 11, they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us here to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we can just serve the Egyptians. Would have been better, us, better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in Egypt. The wilderness, God had a promised land that he was leading them to. And they said, we don't want that. Just let us go back to Egypt. But you know what God did? He parted the Red Sea. He conquered the Egyptians. But it wasn't before Israel grumbled and complained and said, just let us go back and die. And maybe in your life, you've been living in fear. Thinking it was easier before I gave my life to Jesus. Just let me go back to that. My life made more sense than I've got more questions now than I had then. Just, I just want it to be easy. God never promised easy. He promised eternity. He promised salvation. He promised hope. He promised peace. He promised power. He promised his presence, but he didn't say it was going to be easy. Here we go. Number, hot take number two, Exodus chapter 16, two and three. So God has now taken them. He's, he's parted a sea. They've crossed, he's conquered the Egyptian army, and now in Exodus 16, the entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Instead, you brought us into the wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. They look back and say, we want some of that meat and bread. And look, I like meat and bread. I I like it a lot. I'm not gluten-free. I'm not dairy-free. I'm not free of any of it. If it's got flavor, I'm in. (laughs) But these Israelites, they said, just let us go back there. It was just easier then. And in our lives, are we living by faith? Are we saying, yeah, but I just, just, God, just let me have some of that stuff. God, all my friends are doing this and all my friends and all... And it just, they just, it looks easier. Again, this idea that the world can satisfy us better than our God can. Exodus chapter 17, now they're thirsty and they say, you brought us out here and we're dying of thirst. And again, by the way, God, when they complained about food, he gave them manna. He gave them quail. They would eat all they wanted, all they needed. God provided for them. In Exodus 17, they're thirsty. He gives them water from a rock. In Exodus chapter 4, or I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 32, Moses goes up into the mountain to hear from God to receive the law. And it takes him a long time to get down. And so Exodus 32, when the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, they gathered Aaron and said, make gods for us who will go before us because this Moses, the man who brought us up from this land of Egypt, we don't even know what's happened to him. So they created these golden calves and Moses comes down from the mountain with the law of God and there they are worshiping idols. We experience that in our own life sometimes. Maybe we feel like God is delaying and answering our prayer. God, I don't even know where you're at. I'm just gonna go back and do the things that I used to do. I'm just gonna live on my own terms. In chapter five, they're complaining, or in Numbers chapter 11, the people are complaining 
And Moses starts complaining too. And he says, God, just kill me. I can't deal with these people anymore. In Numbers chapter 14, finally, the people say, we are not going into the promised land. There's giants in that land. There's, there's enemies in that land. We're not going. We're, and Moses, you're out. We're going to vote for some new leaders and we're going to go back to Egypt. And so Numbers 14, verse 30, God says to them, I swear that none of you will enter the land I promised to settle you in, except Caleb and Joshua. And I'll bring your children, whom you said would become plunder to the land you rejected, and they will enjoy it. But as for you, your corpses will fall in this wilderness. He said, y'all don't want to go? Okay. But I'm going to bring your kids there. A generation later, and y'all have been talking about how your kids are going to die and you're going to be wiped out from the earth. No, you're going to die, <laughs> but your kids are going to enter the promised land. This is, this is hard stuff. So God says, because of unbelief, and ultimately they were unable to enter the promised land. Because of unbelief. And it looked like rebellion, and it looked like complaining, and it looked like hard heartedness, and it looked like turning away from the living God, and it looked like pursuing worldly things instead of godly things. But ultimately, what it was was unbelief. And maybe you've been grumbling, and maybe you've been complaining, and maybe you've been pursuing worldly things instead of godly things, and maybe you've been hard hearted, and maybe you've turned away from the Lord. Ultimately, what that is is unbelief belief, a lack of faith. That's what the writer is telling us this morning. So then he changes gears in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. He says, let me warn you by talking to you about Israel. They died in the wilderness. They didn't enter the rest, the promised land that God had for them because of unbelief. So Hebrews 3, 12, he says, you watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage each other daily while it is still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the reality that we had at the start. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. That verse 14, it says, we've become participants in Christ if we hold firmly to the end. Last week we saw in uh, Hebrews 3, 6, we are that household if we hold on to our confidence and hope. This idea of holding on, of persevering in our faith. Israel didn't do it. They died in the wilderness. They never entered the promise because of unbelief. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, don't fall into that unbelief, but rather hold on. Now, this is, this is hard because the Bible clearly teaches that salvation, the writer uses the rest of the Sabbath rest of God, that is salvation. It is by grace, that is God's favor and blessing. We don't earn it, we don't deserve it. And it's through faith and it's not from our works. But he's talking about this idea of holding on, of persevering in our faith. He's making this emphasis on Israel's behavior and on our holding on firmly to our confidence, hope, reality, our faith. So is is it faith or is it holding on? Which is it? So let's continue reading. And this is, this, is, this is where we're getting into some deep water, but I believe scripture is really clear. So chapter four, verses one through three says this, therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, in other words, it was thousands of years ago that God made a promise to Israel. But that promise still remains even for which day? Today. Since the promise still remains to enter his rest, let us, that is you and I, that is the readers of Hebrews 2,000 years ago, let us be at, beware so that none of us found, be found to have fallen short. For we received the good news just as they did, but the message they heard did not benefit them. Because why? Because they were not united with those who heard it in faith. Okay, so faith is the key. 
For we who have believed or exercised faith have entered into the rest in keeping with what he has said. Okay, so we've got this idea of holding on, but we've got this idea of faith and believing. Lord, help us to get this right and make this clear. Chapter four, verse eight says, if Joshua had given them rest, so after Moses died and all of the children of Israel died, God raised up a new leader. His name was Joshua. And he led those who remained into the promised land. And if Joshua had given them rest, then God would not have spoken later about another day. So in other words, the promised land, that was not the end of God's rest. It was pointing to something better. It was pointing to salvation through Jesus Christ. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. That's me and you. It's all who would place saving faith in Jesus Christ. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works. Okay, faith, belief, and now resting from our works. It's not about our works. When we enter into this rest, we rest from our works, just as God rested from his. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest. He says, we're resting from our works, but now I need you to make every effort <laughs> to enter that rest. So that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. So we see faith and belief are the deciding factors in verses one and two. In verse 10, we're told that the person who enters salvation or God's Sabbath rest, rests from their own works. But then verse 11 says, make every effort to enter that rest. So Lord, help us to make sense of this. The bottom line here is that we are saved, that is entering into God's Sabbath rest by grace alone and through faith alone. We don't earn our salvation by our work or by our obedience or by holding on with all our might. However, saving faith is demonstrated and proved by obedience and holding on and persevering faith to the end. It is belief that leads to behavior. So we're a t church that teaches because you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and it's nothing that you do, then once you're saved, you are eternally saved. You cannot lose a salvation that you didn't earn to begin with. But in churches like ours that are focused on God's grace, we can sometimes go too far in leading people to believe they're saved when they're not saved. And this is where I need to remind you, this is God's word, not my words. But the, he, the writer of Hebrews wants us to take faith seriously this morning. So let's define faith. Because in our culture, for a lot of people, faith is just kind of like optimism, right? Faith is just hope. Faith is maybe being religious. We say that someone's a person of faith because they, because they exercise some kind of religious devotion to one of the many religions that exist in the world. And, and we call that faith. But that is not what the Bible calls faith. For many, faith is a feeling or faith is a one-time event. I, I had faith one time. I went forward at a Billy Graham crusade. That, that's my faith. But then they've never exercised faith in any other area of their life ever since then. But there was this one-time event. And, and maybe it was saving faith, but the question is, does it hold firm to the end? Does it persevere to the end? Genuine Christian faith, saving faith, persevering faith. How do we define that? How do we understand that? We don't want just this fuzzy idea of faith, this feel good chicken soup for the soul idea of faith. We want saving faith, faith that transforms, faith that holds us fast to the end, even when we can't hold on on our own. So there's a pastor named J.I. Packer. He's this old British guy. 
Actually, he's now a dead British guy, but he was old. He wrote a book called Taking God Seriously. And um, I, it's, a, it's an easy little book. I've got it in my office. And one chapter is called Taking Faith Seriously. So listen to what he says about faith. I love this definition. Faith is a belief and behavior commitment to Jesus Christ. It's a belief that leads to behavior. Faith is a belief and behavior commitment to Jesus Christ, the divine human Lord, who came to earth, died for sins, rose from death, returned to heaven, reigns now over the cosmos as his father's nominated vice regent, will reappear to judge everyone and take his own people into glory where they will be with him in unimaginable joy forever. That's not a fuzzy definition of faith, right? It's real clear. Faith is not optimism. Faith is not having a generally positive attitude. Faith is a belief, behavior, commitment to Jesus Christ, the divine human Lord, came to earth, died for sins, rose from death, returned to heaven, reigns in the cosmos, will reappear to judge the living and the dead, will take his people to glory where we will be with God in unimaginable joy forever. That's faith. And so the writer of Hebrews says, hey, listen, is that what faith looks like in your life? Is that what faith looks like in your life? Does your faith change you? Does your faith make you uncomfortable? When God's word says things that you don't like, does your faith say, you know what, God's right, I'm wrong? Is that the kind of faith you have? Because if it's not, I'm not sure if it's faith or not. I, church, I love y'all. I love you. I'm like one of those guys who doesn't like conflict. I don't like to make people uncomfortable. I like to get along with people. I also love God's word. And I take God's word seriously. And when God's word says, hey, wake up and listen and pay attention. Then you know what I got to say? Hey, wake up, listen, and pay attention. Even if it <laughs> makes my stomach hurt. And today the writer of Hebrews is saying, wake up, listen, and pay attention. Because some of y'all have got this idea of faith, but it is not faith. And it will not hold you until the end. And when this life is over, that faith will not save you. Because it is not a belief and behavior commitment to Jesus Christ, the divine human Lord who came to earth, died for sins, rose from death, returned to heaven, reigns now over the cosmos as his father's nominated vice regent, the one who will reappear to judge and take his people into glory where they will be with him in unimaginable joy forever. For some of us, maybe our faith is faith in a one-time decision that we made. Didn't, didn't really change our life, but we prayed a prayer. Look, faith is faith. It's not works. But it's got to be saving, abiding, persevering faith. Some of us have faith that we're basically better than some other people that we know. Some of us have faith in the fact that we show up to church most of the time. I mean, our record's pretty good. We even give some money. Some of us have faith in our own wisdom instead of God's wisdom. But we pretend like it's somehow piety. Some of us have faith in some kind of vague spirituality where you can do whatever you want, but since God is love, it's okay. It's all gonna work out in the end. But God loves us so much that when we're off track, he says, hey, pay attention. And that's what he's saying today. If I'm making you uncomfortable, do you have enough faith to say, God, could you be speaking to me this morning? God, could you be talking to me this morning? Okay, I gotta land this. So faith is not a work that we perform. 
It's a gift that God gives us through his grace. So chapter 4, verse 3 says this. For we who have believed, put our faith in Christ, to enter the rest in keeping with what he has said. So I swore in my anger that they, those who did not believe, will not enter my rest. Even though his works, God's works, have been finished since the foundation of the world. For somewhere he spoke about the seventh day in this way. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Again, in the passage, he says, they will never enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter it because of disobedience, he again specifies a certain day today. He specified speaking this through David after such a long time today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. So this is telling us, it says, God finished his works. God rested from his works after the seventh day. So it's telling us that since the foundation of the world, the gift of God's Sabbath rest was accomplished. God's gift of Sabbath rest was accomplished before the foundation of the world. That God rested from his works and we can rest from our works. So how does that, how does that work? This idea that here I am today, but somehow God did this thing before the foundation of the world. And how, do, how does that work with me today? God, ages ago, how do those things fit together? I'm glad you asked. Here's what Peter, one of the disciples says in his letter, 1 Peter 1, 20 through 21. He, Jesus Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Do we accomplish our salvation through our work? Absolutely not. God accomplished our salvation before the foundation of the world when he appointed Jesus Christ to be the author and finisher and perfecter of our faith. But now in these last days, he has been revealed to us and we respond in faith. And we say, God, thank you for what you've done. And we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. Not this vague idea of optimism that God likes me. He doesn't just like you folks. He loved you before the foundation of the world. Listen to this, Ephesians chapter one, verse four. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. God knew you before you were a twinkle in your great, 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 grandfather's eye. Book of Psalms says your days were numbered. that your story was written. Do we work for our salvation? Absolutely not. God established that before the foundation of the world and he chose us. He did the work and he calls us to respond in faith. But faith is not just this Faith grabs us by the collar and changes our life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We have died to our old selves and we live to Christ. We have been bought with a price. Our lives are not our own. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. There's an old song called The Wondrous Cross. And one of the verses ends like this, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all, that's what faith is. That's what faith is. So how do we know? And this is the ending. How do we know whether or not 
we have exercised saving faith, faith that perseveres to the end. How do we know if we are holding on to the one who is holding on to us? How do we know? How do we know? How do we know if faith is not just this kind of vague optimism for us, but it is a real and life-changing reality in our lives? How do we know? Well, the passage that we read this morning ends with these words, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and effective. And it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's not my job to judge you. God's word is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of our heart. And this morning, if you're thinking, God, I don't know. I don't know what kind of faith I got. He's given us a mirror. We hold our lives up to this mirror and we see the truth. We see the reality. <laughs> Verse 13, no creature, that's me and that's you. Nothing is hidden from him. We can hide things from ourselves. We can hide things from others, but nothing is hidden from him. All things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I don't know about you, but that sounds uncomfortable to me. And if you're uncomfortable this morning, I just wanna ask, are you taking faith seriously? This letter to the Hebrews is a letter to us this morning. Watch out that none of you have an evil, unbelieving heart. I don't have an evil heart. Well, is it an unbelieving heart? Are there places in your life that you are not believing God? When we finally come to enter the rest that only Jesus will give, can give, we will truly experience what Jesus promised in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you Rest, take my yoke upon you, learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. This morning, there is rest for you. Today, rest for today through faith. And this morning, maybe you need to respond in faith. Maybe you've been showing up, you've been hanging around, been checking it out, but you've never surrendered in faith to Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord. Today, I want to urge you in a moment, we're going to stand and sing. I want to urge you to come down here to the front and there will be folks who would pray with you and show you how to surrender in faith to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you made a one-time decision a long time ago and there's been ups and downs and maybe right now the truth is you're living in unbelief. You're like those Israelites who grumbled and complained and said, but just that meat and that bread was so good. There's something that you're hanging on to. There's something that you're longing for that is not Jesus. Examine your heart this morning. I would invite you this morning to come forward and just have a time of rededication and say, Lord, thank you for your saving faith in my life. Help me to hold on as you're holding on to me. So let's stand up this morning. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is alive and is active and is able to penetrate and change and transform. Lord, let us submit and surrender to your word today. Oh Lord, I pray that you would convict and convince today. Lord, there are folks here today who need to do business with you. And Lord, maybe they're holding on because of pride because of what other people would think. Maybe they're offended that you would talk to them this way. But Lord, don't let us be hard-hearted. But today, would we respond in faith? Lord, some for salvation, some for rededication, 
But Lord, as you call us, may we respond today. We need you this morning, Lord, to soften our hard hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, I invite you to respond. Maybe some of our freeway altar workers could come help if anybody wants to pray with somebody this morning. But let's respond as God calls us.